in worship today, we remember those saints who have gone before us. We honor the light they shined in our lives. We acknowledge the faith they demonstrated for us. We celebrate the love they left behind as their legacy. Let us worship God along with all our saints in heaven. Please stand as you are able and join us for our opening hymn for all the saints. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship here at Claremont United Church of Christ. It is a joy to be here to worship with each and every one of you. If you are here in the sanctuary, we invite you to take the blue pew pads that are in each pew. Sign in and you can see who is worshiping next to you today. You can pass it down the row and once it gets to one end, bring it back. If you are visiting with us, we would love for you to leave a phone number or email address so that we can reach out and welcome you later this week. After the service today, you are invited, if you would like to learn more about the church and the denomination, to a new member class. It'll be about 20 minutes, and it's a great way to learn more about this community. It's in a room labeled the Myrick Room, just outside the sanctuary doors here, Pastor Jen, will be there to lead the class, and we would love for you to join us. 
today is also brunch church, and so if you would like to continue the church fun today, you're welcome to go down to our basement. We had a Dio de los Muertos celebration this past Friday, and so the altar is still up for you to go and look at it. It's gorgeous and honor your loved ones today. So I'll be doing my sermon. We'll be having live music from Maritri at Brunch Church. And we'll also take some time to just do kind of a Q&A back and forth with a, with a pastor after the sermon. And so if you'd like to dig a little deeper, we would love for you to join us for Brunch Church. There is a lot happening this coming week that we want to draw your attention to. This coming Friday and Saturday is the annual Pilgrim Festival down the street with our beloved pilgrims at Pilgrim Place. And so they work on this all year, and it's a lot of great family fun. So if you don't know about it, be sure to look it up and check it out. Tomorrow is our book group studying a book by Anne Lamott. These book group discussions are always really rich. You don't have to have read the book before. If you don't know anything about Anne Lamott, it's going to be a great discussion. Her writing is beautiful. This evening is also our spiritual resilience group. Um, they've been meeting every other week for a couple months now, and new people come at any time. It's just kind of a way to unpack perhaps past religious trauma or experiences and be with people who are trying to develop spiritual resilience in their life and to continue to be on a spiritual journey that works for them. And finally, next Sunday is also our laundry love event. And so we've been doing this with uh, quite some regularity. And so in the morning on November 10th, you can join folks from the church down at McLean Laundry. Um, the people who organize it have a card. The church puts money on it. And we just pay for people's laundry over the course of two hours, talk with people, get to know the community. It's a really beautiful experience. And we would love for you to be a part of it. Oh, I actually have more I want to share adult education opportunities next Sunday. Before the service, there's going to be someone who has um, historically been working in Russia with orphanages there, who since the war in Ukraine has been working in Ukraine, will have a lot of to say about experiences within Ukraine. And so that will be at nine o'clock before the service. And then afterwards at 1115, look in your Friday emails about an event on building emotional stability, especially during the season with the holidays coming up. It'll be a great way to just think about how we increase our emotional intelligence. And so that will be a great opportunity put on by a board of arts and education. All right, today is a very special Sunday in the life of the church, and we are honoring our saints in the church. And so we're going to be coming down to this little altarpiece here, and we'll be reading the names of anyone in our church who has passed in the last year, as well as names of your loved ones that you submitted to our church office. And as we do so, Pastor Jen and I are going to be taking a stone and putting it here in our little annual All Saints Memorial. And we invite you, when a name is read, and you can even prepare yourself to come down as the name's about to be read, we invite you to also take a stone today and take a moment to remember your loved one and those important to you. As we give thanks for this great cloud of witnesses, we are told in Scripture, that surround us at all times and are with us even in this moment, cheering us on as we continue our own journeys here on earth. So thank you to our bells for accompanying us today. Let us remember our saints. We begin with Demi Michelle Aguirre. Louis Thomas Aloro. Reverend Richard Alvarez. Jean Anderson. Barbara Angel. Donna Ansel. Liza Beth Anual. Lino Ariaga. Nancy Baker Velasquez. Lori Barbera. David Fidel. Jamie Beltran. William Berger. Virginia Brickley. Jose Aguilar Briones. 
Rob Burwell. Betsy Calvert. Reverend Edward E. Cantu. Maria Chang. Pat Chang. Maria Chen. Robert Cobos. Richard Lee Corbin. Arlene Burns Coward. Linda Cutting. Donna Danielson. Maricela de los Rios. Jimmy Durkin. Elizabeth Dutcher. Jim Fisk. Joseph Ford. Elsie Fraudenberger. Christopher Howard Gale. Justine Garcia. Bernita Guyman. Dennis Guyman. Roseanne Gibson. Charles Gelia. Mrs. Ruth S. Cantu Gonzalez. Jane Pilatos Good. Alberta Headley. Judy Hilgert. Justin Jackson. Jenea James. David Jameson. Barbara Jared. Marlene Heath. Lynn Knox. Sally Liebhart. Katie Liao. Rodney Lehman. John LaRue. Steve Lewis. Francisco Laura. Robert Bob Huntington Leminska. Peter Ian Lunsford. Glenn Meehan. Carolyn Miles. Sakuro Miramontes. Marguerite Moan. Marie Moan. Andrew Oldshoe. Maria Oliver. Rosalie Ontiveros. Levy V. Orishon. Marlene Park. Wayne Hall Pearson. Beth Peterson. Reverend Dr. William Bill Peterson. Robert M. Payton. 
John Peter Platt. Maurizio Polini. Lucy Quinn. Jimmy Ramos. Diane Ring. Glenn Roberts. Camille Samudio. Stanley Rose. Karen Scalero. Tony Ciarata. Nancy Sedgwick. Brian Service. Margaret Service. Deanne Sherlock. Mary Carolyn Evans Shine. Megan Seitz. Denise Solis. Mary Stewart. Glinda Stickles. Matthew Swain. Judith Terzi. Joanne Tobison. Nina Vargas. Casilda Vasquez. Vilma Cecilia Vegas. Petra Velasco. Martha Mab Vopel. Reggie Webb. Bob Weingarten. God, we come to you in a prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude for every name that was spoken aloud today and for every name we speak in our hearts before you now. We thank you for the great promises that you make to us, a promise that death is not the end of our journey, a promise that you have made a room for each of us in your house and where you are, we too will go. May the loved ones that have gone before us join you and all the saints in the great chorus of the heavenly worshiping community, proclaiming your great love now and forevermore. In gratitude we pray, amen. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with each of you. And I invite those of you worshiping online to share in the chat a moment when you experienced Christ's peace this week in your life. And at this time, I invite our young friends to come forward. Thank you. 
morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. My question for you this morning, raise your hand if you've ever heard of a family tree. A family tree. Who has heard of a family tree? Okay, quite a few of you. So if you're new to this idea, a family tree is something we make to remind us of the members of our family and all who came before us. In your family tree, you might have your grandparents or your aunts and uncles or even people that are from way back that you were born before you were before you were born making a family tree can be a really helpful thing to do when we want to learn more about our history and the history of our families did you also know though that we have a faith family tree maybe something like this our faith family tree goes all the way back to the Bible, and it's still growing and stretching on its branches and inviting more people to be a part of it. That means you and I are family, even if we aren't related. And that means everyone in this church is part of your family. I'm going to say, hi, family. Our faith family tree is so big that we can't even see everyone who's a part of it. But because we're all connected by God and because of Jesus who holds us together. And today is a special day on the church calendar, All Saints Sunday. All Saints Sunday is, oh, here's more of my family. (laughs) All Saints Sunday is a day when we think about our big faith family tree. We remember all the people that have came before us. And we think about all the people have taught us about our faith and how to follow God. And even though many of our saints are in heaven and they're not here anymore, we can still remember all that they have taught us. So today let's remember these important people in our lives and that God has given each of us a place in this big, expanding faith family tree. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus. Thank you for all the names on our faith family tree. Help us to keep growing and keep remembering. And all God's children said. All right, we are off to Sunday school or you can go sit back with your grown-ups. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward to collect this morning's offering. And if you're worshiping with us online, there is a QR code available for you. And there's also a QR code in your bulletin if you would like to donate digitally. And today, since it's All Saints Sunday and we're remembering those who have gone before us and handed down this faith that we carry to us because of their great faithfulness, I invite you to make an offering in their honor this morning. Thank you for giving and being part of this ever-growing community of faith.
great God of giving, we offer our resources this morning in honor of our faithful saints and as signs of our faithfulness to you and your ways of justice and peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the epistle to the Philippians chapter 3. Siblings, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Siblings, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've often told you of them and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things but our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of God's glory by the power that also enables God to make all things subject to God's self. The summer after I graduated from seminary, I was awarded a fellowship from an organization called Fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics, which each year took 15 seminarians, 15 MBA students, 15 medical students, 15 law students, and 15 journalism students to Holocaust sites around Germany and Poland, where the final solution was both planned and subsequently carried out. It was an intensive study program where the majority of our time while we were touring was spent in seminars and discussion groups. And the purpose of the program was to demonstrate to future professionals how leaders in all of these industries, the church, businesses, hospitals, courtrooms, media groups, fail to stand up and prevent the Holocaust. The hope was that by studying the moral failures of the past, participants could hopefully use their vocational platforms to stand up to injustice in the future. And the church, in particular, was certainly complicit in the rise and support of Adolf Hitler. Protestants overwhelmingly supported the Nazi party during elections in 1932 and 1933. They were excited about the idea of a close bond between the throne and the altar, between the state and the church. Under Hitler's leadership, what was known as the German Evangelical Church, or the Reich Church, came to prominence, and the goal of the German Evangelical Church was to function as a state church. Church leadership conspired with government leaders to require clergy to sign a statement of allegiance to Hitler. The church in Germany became defined by their support of a specific political leader and the parallels between the German evangelical church then and Christian nationalism today are frightening. There were Christians, however, who stood against the Third Reich and the German evangelical church. They formed the Confessing Church, which was an underground movement of Christians who refused to pledge allegiance to the Nazi state. One of the leaders of the Confessing Church, the theologian Karl Barth, who is a super famous guy among church nerds, wrote the Barman Declaration, one of the most important statements to ever be written within Protestant Christianity on par with Martin Luther's theses. And the Barman Declaration had six theses that stated that the church can never become subject to the state. Jesus Christ and Jesus alone is the head of the church, and people of faith should never bow down to any political figure. The words of the Barman Declaration echo the words of our scripture reading today, written by the Apostle Paul, a Roman citizen, who reminds us that our ultimate citizenship is in heaven, not in Rome, not in the United States. 
And as Christians, we are tied to one another, not by the boundaries of our nation, but by the higher calling given to us by the God that created us. A calling to carry out God's will on earth as it is in heaven. In an attempt to speak to that higher calling, and in an attempt to help the church stand up to injustices in our present moment, I believe it is incumbent upon me as a clergy person and all of us as a church to wholeheartedly condemn some of the rhetoric that has been used in this election season. There's a graphic I've seen posted all over social media the last couple of weeks that says this. If you can't understand why your trans friend is scared right now, then you don't have a trans friend. You know a trans person. The transgender community has consistently been under attack in campaign ads, and one that aired this last Sunday and Monday during nationally televised NFL football games to millions of Americans should make you absolutely sick to your stomach. In the ad, Kamala Harris is condemned for supporting a law that allows transgender prisoners to receive gender-affirming care while in prison, and then condemned for supporting transgender athletes. And then the ad flashes this image. Kamala is for they, them. Donald Trump is for you. There is so so much wrong with this ad. First, among many issues, none of the transgender individuals in the ad gave permission for their images to be used, and subsequently, the people depicted have had their lives turned upside down by death threats to them and their families. The ad completely dismisses the validity of they, them pronouns, which are not only used by the transgender siblings of ours, but also by our non-binary siblings. It also ostracizes and otherizes the transgender community by suggesting that Donald Trump is for you, not the they, thems over there that are completely different than you, the common American. And finally, it makes support of the transgender community into a political issue. And this just is not about a difference in political opinion. The lives of our transgender siblings are at risk, and we must do something about it. And sadly, this was just one of many campaign ads that have specifically targeted the transgender community and anyone who supports them. The result of this vitriol and this rhetoric is that anti-transgender legislation continues to be put forward at an alarming rate. 662 anti-trans bills have been proposed in 45 states in 2024 alone. One passed in Odessa, Texas, just two weeks ago, makes it illegal for someone to use any bathroom other than the one that matches their sex assigned at birth. And anyone who brings a lawsuit against someone violating the law can be awarded $10,000 in personal compensation, which effectively puts a bounty on transgender individuals and allows people to profit off of their persecution. It is understandable why the transgender community would be afraid for their lives right now. Their very existence is under threat, with popular radio hosts even calling for the elimination of the transgender community. Later this month, we will be hosting a Transgender Day of Remembrance service to remember transgender individuals who have lost their lives this year due to the de facto and de jure hate in our country. And church... If we don't speak up against the attacks on the LGBTQIA plus community, we are going to see their rights stripped away again and again, just like the liberties of the Jewish community last century. This is part two of a two-part sermon series meant to address our great angst leading up to Tuesday's election. If you missed Pastor Jen's sermon last week, I encourage you to watch it. It was a great civics lesson and a reminder that both the church and the state, while separate spheres, are designed to make our communities better for everyone. As Pastor Jen said last week, we believe in the separation of church and state, and as such, it is important for a church not to become partisan, but it is also essential for a church to have the moral fortitude to remain prophetic. 
As I've mentioned in past sermons, the role of the prophets in the Old Testament scriptures was not to predict the future. It was to hold political leaders accountable for their actions. I don't care what political party it is, but anyone who pays millions of dollars to intentionally target and oppress the transgender community must be stopped. And I will be the first to declare that our prophetic speech as a church must confront the moral failings of both sides of this nation's two-party system. Again, as I have said before, we have gone backward in our uh, humanity of our immigration policies and in an attempt to curry favor from moderates, President Biden has made it unnecessarily difficult for asylum seekers to find refuge in our nation. So too, the current administration in deference to foreign alliances has failed to prevent the mass bombings of innocent civilians, many of them women and children in Palestine. Children are starving and we are not responding. This is the exact moral failing addressed by the prophets in our Bible. Our government, as well as our churches, are currently failing to do everything in their power to address critical issues that affect people Jesus referred to as the least of these, such as affordable housing, climate change, access to mental and physical health care, and so much more. Abraham Lincoln, in the midst of the Civil War, declared that people were too concerned with worrying about whether God was on their side, and we know full well that God was used to justify slavery then, just as God is used to justify homophobia and transphobia today. Instead, Lincoln said, we should be more concerned with whether or not we are on God's side. When I mentioned that we need to be prophetic, not partisan, to be partisan, as many churches in our country have become, is to believe that any one political party is without blemish and is therefore worthy of our uncritical support, that it is the source of our salvation. Our passage from Philippians also reminds us that we will never find salvation in any man-made institution, whether it is a political party or a religious denomination. Our salvation is found in Christ alone. Now, don't get me wrong. I personally, as Jacob Blue Gulps, have my own individual beliefs that the results of Tuesday's election very much matter for the safety of our trans siblings and the rest of the LGBTQI plus community, for our dreamers, for immigrants, for women wanting control over their bodies, for people of color, people with disabilities, those practicing other faiths, and many more. And I'm allowed to have my own opinion about that, just as you all are all allowed to have your own opinions as well. But no matter what happens on Tuesday, when we wake up on Wednesday morning, the work of the church, the work that God calls us to do, will not change no matter what. I was going through some of my old sermons this week, and I found one that I had preached at a church I worked at from 2013 to 2016 that was dedicated entirely to educating people about what it means to be transgender. That sermon came at a different time, a different place, so many of the people in my church had never even heard of the term transgender, let alone knew someone who was transgender. The sermon was meant to educate people about the existence of the transgender community and why it was spiritually essential that we support our trans siblings. We're excited that our next brunch church after today, November 17th, will be a trans 101 presentation by a trans individual in our congregation, Celeste Irwin, so you all are invited to join. But in 2014, that church in Lincoln, Nebraska, was able to put our discussions into practice when Lincoln Public Schools made national news because they had asked teachers to use gender-neutral terms in the classroom. And church members were able to go to school board meetings to advocate for the district to keep their handbook on gender inclusivity when disgruntled parents were trying to remove it from teacher training. Later, an incredibly courageous transgender woman at that church in Lincoln agreed to convene a lunch where we invited all the pastors of the conservative churches in the city to a meal where they could meet a transgender person and ask her any questions they wanted to. And eight pastors took us up on the invitation and they came to the meal and it ended with hugs and expressions of mutual support. 
My final sermon at that church in July 2016 was a reminder that advocating for trans individuals should be at the forefront of our work as the church. And then our candidating sermon at this church in August 2016, where you all decided whether or not you wanted to hire the two of us, was a declaration that we believe that God is transgender. Now, all of that took place during the Obama presidency. And the work of the church to support the transgender community continued through the Trump presidency and the Biden presidency and will continue on November 6th and beyond. When we wake up on Wednesday, we will continue to strive to be on God's side rather than make God come to our side. When we wake up, we will strive to respond to the calling that God has put on us and has put on our church. When we wake up, we will stand up on behalf of our LGBTQIA plus siblings. When we wake up, we will work to dismantle racism and the patriarchy, which will still be alive and well on Wednesday. When we wake up, we will pray for and work to end the war in Palestine. When we wake up, we will advocate that all workers in our nation deserve to be paid a livable wage. When we wake up, we will try to be more sustainable so that we can protect our planet for future generations. When we wake up, we will proclaim that a woman should be able to make her own choices about her body. When we wake up, we will love all individuals equally, whether they are from a different country or practice a different faith or belong to a different political party. When we wake up, we will work to create more affordable housing in California. When we wake up, we will open ourselves up to learning and growing and stretching our faith. When we wake up, we will be ready for the Holy Spirit to lead us into whatever work God has for us. That is what our loved ones, whom we remember today on All Saints Sunday, were called to do before us through all the presidencies of their lifetimes. And it is what the generations that come after us will be called to do through all the presidencies of their lifetimes. And it is what Christ did 2,000 years ago in the face of the political power of Rome. He followed the call of God to preach good news to all people, even when that led to the cross. And not even the strength of the Roman Empire putting Jesus to death was able to stop that good news. So when we come to the communion table today, may it be a reminder to us that when we wake up on Wednesday, love will still win. Amen? The communion table is the greatest declaration of love, a love that transcends even death. As we come to this communion table, we do so with the invitation also to the youngest disciples among us. So as they come in today, we invite you to sing with us. This is where children belong. this time of communion, you will be invited by our deacons, row by row, to come forward and receive today's elements. You can come and you can take the bread and the cup. You can dispose of the cups on each end. There are gluten-free wafers available as well. And for anyone who needs to remain in their seats, that is okay. You can raise your hand if you would like communion, and one of our deacons will come to you. If you are watching online with us today, we invite you to go to your kitchen, grab something to drink, grab something to eat, enjoy Marie Tree's gorgeous music as we come to the table together. A reminder that every person, 
no matter what and no matter who they vote for on Tuesday is welcome at this table and we will take this communion together. Amen. Friends, God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. God who exists outside of time and space, we come to this table because it is a glimpse of a future table, a table that stretches as far as our eyes can see, a table that is full of your bountiful, a table where no one goes hungry or sits alone, a table where everyone we have ever loved and who has ever loved us sits and feasts together. In our own lives, we sit at tables where now there are empty chairs, where people we love and miss no longer join us for dinner or come over for the holidays. And we grieve those empty chairs, but we also know that in Christ, our separation is only temporary. For the saints, we have your presence this morning, God. We give thanks, and we come gladly to this table to eat once more with those we love and to join with all the saints in praising Christ, who has overcome death, and leads us all to God's heavenly banquet, reminding us that death is not the end, but a new beginning. For Jesus proved that God's love is stronger than death. And so today we say we do not fear death. It is a shadow fleeing before your burning light of love and wholeness. We proclaim the mystery of our faith in the resurrection. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, so that the bread we break and the cup we share may remind us that in ordinary things your love is seen, in ordinary lives your grace is found, and in ordinary days we can find your presence. Amen. Friends, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant, and it's sealed in my blood. So whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat this bread and share this cup, we proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again to us in his glory. So let us keep this feast. or imagine your words more certain than the rising sun Don't let my heart be troubled There's light at the end of this tunnel I know you're up to something Something greater I might not have eyes to see it Give me the faith to believe it. I know you're up to something, something greater. Your promises will surely come to life. Not today, then in your perfect time. It's gonna be bright, better than I could ever ask or dare imagine. Your faithfulness to see me through the night. Don't let my heart be troubled. There's light 
at the end of this tunnel I know you're up to something something greater I might not have eyes to see it but give me the faith to believe it I know you're up to something something greater Something greater If you said it, I'll see it If you promised, you'll keep it Show me a limit, you'll exceed it I believe, oh, I believe You said it, I'll see it If you promised, you'll keep it Show me a limit you'll exceed it oh I believe I believe God I believe I believe don't let my heart be troubled there's light at the end of this tunnel, I know you're up to something, something greater. I may not have eyes to see it, just give me the faith to believe it. I know you're up to something, something greater. light at the end of this tunnel. I know you're up to something, something greater. It's coming to take me away One glad morning to take me away Far away from here Two horsemen leading into behind My soul is bleeding and the pain won't subside Is so heavy, it anchors my soul. My body betrays me, I'm losing control, I'm losing, but far away. The sun's always shining and the moon's full of love. Your father's calling and I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go away. See me and I'm crying 
unsteady and slow when you're ready to go I'm ready to go home I'm ready to go spirit is floating over the bed remember my darling the things that I've said and far away cause I'll never leave you I'm here by your side don't let life betray you just swallow your pride and far away mama's never far away I'll ever show, I'll ever show if you see me and I'm crying I'll wipe away your tears and know I'll be waiting for you the end of your the end of your years end of your Chariot's coming, chariot's coming, chariot's coming, chariot's coming. thousand times a million doors to eternity I may have lived a thousand lives a thousand times an endless turning stairway climbs to a tower of souls if it takes another thousand years a thousand wars the towers rise to numberless floors and space well, I could shed a thousand tears, a million breaths, a million names, but only one truth to face. A million roads, a million fears, a million suns, ten million years of uncertainty. speak a million lies, a million songs, a million rights, a million wrongs in this balance of time. There were 
was a single truth, a single light, a single thought, a singular touch of grace. And following this single point, this single flame, this single haunted memory of your face, I still. times the mysteries unfold themselves like galaxies in my head. I may be numberless, I may be innocent, I may know many things, I may be ignorant, or I could ride with kings and conquer many lands. This world of cards and let it slip my hands. I could be cannon food, destroyed a thousand times, reborn as fortune's child to judge another's crimes, or oh, wear this pilgrim's cloak, or be a common thief. I've kept this single faith, I have but one. times the mysteries unfold themselves like galaxies in my head. On and on the mysteries unwind themselves eternally still unsaid. Till you love me. Please pray with me. God of this age and all ages, on this Sunday of remembrance and reflection, we pray that you would remind us that none of us are outside of your redemptive reach. We pray that you would remind us each of our inherent value and our identity as your beloved children. Send your spirit to guide us and help us stay on the path you have carved out for us in this world and gently call us back whenever we stray. We pray today for those who are hurting, those who are lonely and in need of your love and grace. We pray for those who are seeking you and trying to follow your teachings. We pray for those who are anxious for the week ahead. We pray for those who are struggling with their own inner demons. And we pray for those who are holding specific prayers in their hearts today. We ask that you would hear the contents of their prayers and fill them with the comfort of knowing you are present with each of us, always. We pray these things together using the words you teach us, saying together, Great giver, in whom heaven is found, holy is your name. May your commonwealth of peace and freedom flourish on earth. Give us this day bread for our journey and make us hungry to see the whole world nourished. Forgive us and help us forgive one another. Strengthen us for the challenges that lie ahead. Let us hear your prophets and deliver us from our privilege. For your love is the only power, the only home, the only honor we need in this world and in the world to come. Amen.
In addition to all the gorgeous music today, we have the organist prodigy Christian ready to play for you. Uh, what I love about officiating at the communion table is being able to look in every single person's eyes and to say, this is the bread and the cup of life for you. And to know truly that every, every, every person in this world who would come to this table, that the bread and the cup of life is for them as well. When we wake up on Wednesday, let us bring that truth into reality, that God's love is for all people. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen. If you remember Animal Blessing Sunday, all species too.